All right, thank you for joining us live today. We have a very special talk about cicadas and the Brood X and all things about them because people have questions. Are they coming here? Are they not coming here? How long are they going to stay? So many questions. So we brought three of our favorite people from the University of Maryland Extension office and they stretch from Queens County all the way to Dorchester. And ladies, thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Of course. Thanks for having us, Bruce. Give us a chance. Introduce yourself. Tell the people who you are and which part of the Extension office you're with. Sure. Oh, me first. Hey. Yeah, Rachel. Hey, everybody. My name is Rachel. I'm the Horticulture Educator and Master Gardener Coordinator for the University of Maryland Extension in Queen Anne's County. And I'm Michaela Boley. I am also the Horticulture Educator and Master Gardener Coordinator in Talbot County. So, and I'm Emily Zobel. I am the Agriculture Extension Agent and Horticulture Agent and Master Gardener Coordinator for Dorchester County. Yay! So we have, all of us. We, have, we, have, yeah, we have this large space, the area of the Eastern Shore covered today. That's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so we are live. So if you're watching and you have any questions about cicadas, or brood X, or Maryland Extension Office at all, just send them in your comments. I'll make sure they hear them. So let's talk about cicadas, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we're really excited. So these guys are fresh off the western shore this morning. Yeah. yeah. So you you just went over there and caught some brown river. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. We did a field trip this morning. Mm -hmm. Yes, to get some fresh ones. For yep. You. So tell us what we're looking at. So these are cicadas. These are a type of true bug. So that means they have a piercing sucking mouth part um, versus something like a grasshopper or a locust, which is going to have a chewing mouth part. So these guys are mainly going to be feeding on sap of trees. Um, and, and when they actually they f spend about 17 years feeding on the root systems of hardwood trees mm -hmm. and so that's why brood X is so exceptional is that it's been 17 years since their last emergence and so they've spent those 17 years just feeding on the xylem of root systems not enough to hurt the trees not enough to kill the trees but um, now they're emerging and they're getting ready to mate yep. which is what they do when they're above ground and um, so how many weeks, Emily, will it be of their activity? So they are starting to emerge now. They will be out until probably mid to end of June. And then these guys will slowly die out. And what you will see coming out then will be what we call dog days or annual cicadas. And these are the green black cicadas that come out every single year. So again, what's really interesting about this brood is that they're a 17 year brood. And we do have multiple other 17 year old and 13 year broods, which just basically do these mass emergence every 13 or 17 years. So you're telling me these guys sleep for 17 years, come out, eat, and they, and they mate. Yeah, this is their yeah. life. It's like yeah. having a teenager at your house. <laughs> <laughs> It's very <laughs> but, but it might not be so glamorous for them, right? Exactly. They, they no, have a no. rough experience when they come out, yeah. don't they? And they're kind yeah. of sensationalized because they come out in such large numbers. And yeah. then, of course, when they're developed enough, these ones you can tell aren't, aren't singing, they aren't making any noise, but they can make collectively a, a lot of noise. And it yeah. causes, I don't say it causes concern with homeowners, but maybe a little consternation because they don't care if it's night or day. Exactly. <laughs> they just want to sing their song of their people. Right. And you Rachel, know? if you could please, you have a great mimic of their of their song. Oh, <laughs> you don't want to hear that. No, okay. Trust me. <laughs> I will say if you do want to hear any, their calling songs, what you can do is go to cicadamania.com and they have recordings from multiple different broods, both 10, 2, 4, and a whole bunch of others. So you can go on there and listen to individual species calls or just mass callings that were from any of these broods. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about this brood though. So what, what makes them the brood X? So a uh, brood is basically a group of cicadas that emerge in this mass amounts at any given time. So we do have multiple broods all across the northeastern United States. Um, America is really unique in that we're one of the few places on the globe that does this. There's a few other places, I think, down in the tropics that occasionally will have smaller broods, but in this case, brood 10 is the largest emerging brood that we have. It goes all the way from southern New York all the way down to northern Georgia and all the way across to Ohio and basically the Mississippi. So that's a large area. I'm sure most people have questions, especially here in Queens County. So does that include us here? That sadly does not include the Eastern Shore. There has been pockets historically. Um, there was a pocket in Queen Anne's. There was a pocket in um, Talbot. Talbot. Mm -hmm. There's a, in Kent County. There's a pocket of one that was known in Delaware. 
but we haven't necessarily been seeing them the last few broods. And again, every brood is 17 years, so it's sort of a like, well, are we going to see them? Or are we not going to see them? Did we see them 17 years ago? Um, and in these cases, their defense mechanism is this mass emergence. So the idea is by emerging as one large group, you outdo what your predators can eat. So if you have tiny pockets over time, because they're not having as many come out, that pocket slowly shrinks to the point where it disappears. So this little guy in general, how can you tell him different from uh, other broods that are going to be coming out? Does he have any distinguishing uh, marks on him or her? So you can tell the periodical cicadas, which are these broods apart from our dog day ones that come out every year, mainly because of the timing. Again, the dog day ones don't come out until late summer. Based on the broods themselves, we know which brood it is based on the timing and the location of where it is. So because they come out every 17 years and this is where they are, we know that this is brood 10. Gotcha, gotcha. So you do get a few that are off. So like I know some people may have recalled last year in the news, we did have some cicadas that were early risers and decided to come a year early. And next year we'll have small pockets as well mm -hmm. of ones that will just randomly come up, but it's not going to be the mass emergence that it is now. You'll just find like a few stragglers that just didn't get out of bed in time <laughs> for this year. <laughs> yeah, 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 they slept in. They, they slept in yeah, the wow. next yeah, yeah. year. They hit snooze. <laughs> and so, Oh, good. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so we, we do get a lot of questions about why they aren't out here on the eastern shore. And number one, the, the big barrier between us and the western shore is the Chesapeake Bay. And um, they might hate not, traffic. They hate traffic. Right, yeah, that Bay Bridge <laughs> traffic. It'll get you on Friday. <laughs> they don't like sunny beaches. Um, no, they, they can't fly very well. So to do that distance across the bay would, would take um, more effort than they're probably capable of. But we also have a high water table and our soils really just aren't um, conditions that they favor. So we won't find them as much out here on the eastern shore for those reasons. Sure. From a historical standpoint, also with the glaciers, like mm. the eastern shore was covered a lot more than say like the mm. western side. So like the populations established there quicker and were able to you know, generate more. Because again, it's that mass emergence, a handful in one given place is not necessarily going to reproduce enough to have the next generation flood the predators the way that they need to, to make it a stable population that's mm -hmm. going to continue. Got you. And we are live, so if you have any questions for them about cicadas, please let us know. But I'm going to keep peppering you with a couple more, if that's okay. Oh, awesome. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people, when they come out, they're actually kind of scared. I mean, not everyone, but there are some people that are fearful. Of them. Is there anything to be fearful of? I mean, not, maybe not even physically, but to uh, the environment around you? No, I don't know. No, no. So I mean, not really at all. If you live on the western shore and you have um, like newly planted trees, mm -hmm. then you might want to go ahead mm -hmm. and get a net to put over them. And they have specific <laughs> um, cicada the nets side. that you can tie around your tree because they do like to chew um, on the foliage and they, they will. They don't chew on, on the, foliage. Oh, I'm sorry. They don't sorry. have chewing mouth parts. That's, That's right. okay. Sorry. They just gum it. <laughs> <laughs> They'll deposit their eggs in the um, the stems of the tree, so that might weaken those newly um, newly planted shrubs and trees a little bit. So, yeah. if that's the case, then you might want to cover those trees and with a net. And, and really, it's the younger trees that are most susceptible exactly. to damage. Large established trees, um, they they go for the twigs that are much smaller, so they're smaller than a pencil, smaller than your pinky. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. That's what they can oviposit on, and so um, you know maybe the tips of larger trees will be affected, and you'll see them drop later in the summer. But mm -hmm. honestly, it's it's like giving your yourself a little haircut. Uh, it's not really going to affect the tree adversely. Yeah. Right. And so the one thing that we have found scientifically is that these guys are actually really beneficial to trees mm -hmm. because they live underground and they're living. 12 to 18 inches underground and then they burrow up to the surface in order to emerge what they've done is they've created these sort of half inch holes that go that deep and that helps mm -hmm. water filtration and nutrients going back into the soil and they've actually found that trees tend to create more foliage the next following years because of these holes that's like great and i think you just covered holly's question because she asked how far down the earth do they sleep oh yeah yeah, yeah. perfect so there you yeah go. And really, the, the cue for them to, to come up is warming soil temperatures. So this week, our soil temperatures are starting to get to that perfect point. It's 64 degrees. 64 degrees, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, degrees. So um, they like it a little warm, too. Uh, just like us, we're ready for summer. They're ready for summer, too. So they start to come up, and that's when you'll start to see them kind of start to emerge. 
um, they're, they're more nocturnal in their habits of emerging from the soil. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we won't see that as much during the daytime, but that doesn't mean you won't see them crawling around yeah. during the day. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Now let's, let's get super nerdy if we can. We, have, we love we, it. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. good. For it. <laughs> so we have male and female yeah. here today, right? Mm -hmm. How do yeah. we know? So let's see, Emily. Do you want to? Uh, let's a, see which one. I've got a male. Oh, I have a female. <laughs> it's like collecting cards. Ooh, yeah. Look what I got. So, so. you're just going to look up their skirts. So you can see this one it's doesn't it's, have it's an so overpositor. Rude. It's so yeah. rude. You didn't even add, you didn't even take this and, kid out to dinner. <laughs> and and you can see on this one she has a little ovipositor right here. So this is what she's going to make that little slit in your pencil size um, tree tree twig, and she'll deposit her eggs right mm -hmm. there. And she's going to put about twenty to thirty eggs in each slit, and then she'll just go up and down, and do several slits. Um, and then she'll go off and she'll mate again and then she'll do it to another twig. Yeah. Gotcha. And this just started roughly last week, right? Yeah. yeah, about last week. Yeah. And how long are they gonna go? So they'll go probably until mid to end of June. Like mm -hmm. mid-June, they'll start petering off. You'll have some late ones um, that will stick around until the end of June, but normally by July, these guys will be gone. Yeah. Gotcha. How about uh, long, like super long term? So do we find when these bruises are hatching and they're coming out, are their numbers bigger than they were 17 years ago? Or is this like a dwindling thing? So the thing is, is since it's only 17 years, we don't necessarily have a lot of scientific data to sure. tell us yeah. that. So one thing that actually we're asking people to do is to help us with citizen science, which is if you find these someplace, you can download an app called Cicada Safari, and it's free. You can get it both at the... Um, I don't know what the Apple store is. It's the Google Play on, you know, you can get it wherever apps are. <laughs> yeah, they, um, yeah. Wherever your apps are. We can are tell what phone. kind of phone you have. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a flip phone because I'm old school. Um, no, um, so you can go in and download it and it's a free app. You do need to put your GPS on because what it'll do is whenever you take a picture, it'll double check that it is in fact a brood 10 cicada and not, you know, some other random bug and it gets uploaded and it gets geotagged so people can track where they are emerging from. Um, the other thing is, I think I, it's either iNaturalist or mm -hmm. the Audubon Society has one for if you find birds feeding on them, they're trying to track what species of birds are feeding on these guys. Oh, okay, so yeah. there's lots of opportunities yeah. to engage in citizen science with these. And again, with this information and this numbers, we're hoping to be able to track things like, is the population growing? Is the population shrinking? Are they expanding northward? Are they expanding south? Like, where are they? Gotcha. And the University of Maryland also has a really good website called Cicada Crew, where you can go and look for resources or different pictures mm -hmm. of cicadas. And they also have some really cool gear, like stickers yeah. and shirts and stuff like that. And they have a really nicely developed uh, FAQ page. So yes. because we get we are getting a lot of questions in our offices, but um, sometimes those pages have just as much information. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what, what's kind of cool is they sound a lot like locusts, and so I think they get associated a lot sure. just by yeah. process of association. Um, but they do not feed like locusts. They don't yeah. really cause a lot of damage. Um, the noise they have actually comes from, it's like a little drum underneath their wings. Uh, it's called a timbal. And it vibrates. So it's not actually their wings making the noise. It's the little drum under mm -hmm. their wings. And that's what they use to communicate with one another yeah. so loudly. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. All the time. That we all enjoy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you can think of it, it almost as like they'll flick their wings to communicate back and forth with each other. But if they're trying to like call out to get mm -hmm. mates or something like that, they're using this drum organ. So you can think of it as like, well, if I want to sing to serenade one person, I can sing. But if I want to attract a big crowd, I'm going to play like a music instrument. Mm, that's a good point. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. cool. So before I let you go, we're going to do some plugging in a second. But what is your favorite cicada fact? Or what's your favorite thing about them? Oh, man. What's neat? Rachel? Oh, you know, there are some that actually have blue eyes. But it's oh, pretty nice. rare to find. So... Um, I know I was searching for one today when we were looking just to hope that we could get one. Um, so that's mine. As, and I've seen a lot of um, naturalist groups on Facebook. They'll mm -hmm. share pictures from, from all over the northern Virginia and the D.C. Mm -hmm. area, but we did not see any today. Yeah. Uh, I guess my favorite fact is the fact that these are 17 years is a long time for an insect to, to be alive, much less, you know, 
feeding and then coming out and performing the rest of its processes in like a six right. week period. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's just really impressive that uh, nature can do that. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, favorite fact. Um, so I'm really fascinated by all the things that eat it. So you're gonna have a wide variety. <laughs> I love how it dies. <laughs> well, so you're gonna have birds feeding on it. You're gonna have foxes and squirrels. Your dog's gonna eat these. Yes. My cats are fascinated by the few I have at home. But what's really interesting is we can eat them as well. And they yeah. actually have a very cool nutty kind of flavor to them. So you yourself can, can dine on some cicadas if you'd like. We have a recipe on the Cicada Crew website um, mm -hmm. that has all kinds of things. You can make cookies in it, you can make tacos with them, you can boil them up with Old Bay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would caution you though. That's if, why they don't come yeah. to the Eastern Shore. Yeah. If you do have a shrimp allergy, you or really shellfish, yeah. shellfish yeah. allergy, you don't want to cook these because they have the same exoskeleton um, that is similar to a shrimp. So you okay. really don't want to do that. And if your dog is ingesting these, they can cause some medical problems as well. So you want to kind of try to get your dog to make sure not they're not them. chowing down. Not, like yeah, a huge bowl. Well, use yeah. some caution. Yeah. Yes. Your dog can munch on a few on their walk, but don't like let them gouge on. Exactly. Them. I didn't know we were going to get food facts today. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's why I love bringing you ladies in. You cover so much. So speaking of covering so much, where can people get more information? So I would recommend again the Cicada Crew website is a really great one that has good resources. The University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Information Center, mm -hmm. um, which is go.umd.edu-hgic. <laughs> Sorry, we just got a new website. So That's yeah, okay. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. To I put you on the spot with that one. <laughs> so if you go to there and type in cicadas, it'll take you to our cicada website mm -hmm. there, which is going to talk both about the periodical cicadas as well as the dog day cicadas. So even a year when you don't have one of these major broods coming out, you'll still get some information yeah. about those dog day cicadas that come out July, August, and September. And we're yeah. super excited because we're actually the team that does the Garden Time podcast. Yeah. And we have an episode dropping maybe tonight. Hopefully soon. tonight. I need yeah. to, I'm going to finish it as soon as we get done here. So I, I'm going to try to get it out tonight, if not tomorrow You morning. have to now because we yes. said it. I know. <laughs> this is the pressure I really have to do. And, and we uh, interview popular entomologist Dr. Mike Rout. And he uh, is interviewed by us about the cicadas, the periodical cicadas. Awesome. And so we'll have more information on that podcast episode. So, you know, please yeah. tune in. And yeah. you can find our podcast on um, Spotify and iTunes, wherever you download your podcast from, mm -hmm. you can find it. And it's Garden Time, T-H-Y-M-E. All right. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we do have a couple of comments. We had Patrick who said that he thinks the idea of leveraging citizen science against tracking them is great. We can all be part of the discovery of Brood X. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and Jeff Strait's watching too, who always watches. He says it's really interesting stuff because we don't get this information normally. So thank you oh, for sharing awesome. that. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks. We would encourage people to take the time to really travel across the Bay Bridge. Um, maybe do it you know, on a, a non-Friday so you don't have to worry about Bay Bridge traffic. But this is really a natural phenomenon that only happens every 17 years. Yeah. This is the entomological equivalence of Haley's Comet. So like, <laughs> go check them out and you can find them in parks and playgrounds and just, you know, wander around and really just observe them. They're really yeah. fun. They don't bite, they don't sting. You, you can hold them and pick them up and they're fairly harmless. So this is a great way, particularly if you have kids or grandkids, to introduce them to the natural world. That's right. Yeah. So today is a beautiful day. That's right. Yeah. Travel across to the Western Shore, listen to the Garden Time podcast while you drive, <laughs> pull out your phone with your app that you just downloaded, track the cicada or whatever's eating them yep. <laughs> while you're out today and have a great time. Ladies, yeah. thank you so much for for stopping by, bringing the friends and talking about Brood X today. Yeah. Thank, thank you so thank much. You for having we thanks love for having us. having us. That's yeah. course. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for sharing and liking our videos. Please watch more on QACTV.com, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or on Channel 7. And we'll see you next time, sailors. <laughs>